In the year of our Lord, 1314, at the height of midsummer, King Edward II of England and his mighty army advanced upon the Bannockburn. I was a young boy then and lived close to Stirling. News of the approach of Edward's men was all that was talked of, and there was much anxiety. But like any boy, I wished to catch a glimpse of the English soldiers. I had never seen so many men. Knights, archers, men-at-arms, and King Edward himself. There must have been thousands of them. Edward had come to relieve the English soldiers who occupied the castle of Stirling. The castle had been surrounded by the army of Scots, who had waged a long and bitter war to end the English occupation of Scotland. And as Edward's vast force advanced within sight of Stirling's fortress, they saw that the road upon which they marched was blocked. Guarding the road at the edge of a wood was an army of Scots standing in the way of the English approach to the castle. But Stirling was the last stronghold Edward held in Scotland, and he would fight to keep it. A squadron of his finest knights galloped off around to the north so as to pass by the Scots that blocked their way and made for the fortress. Swift as hawks went the knights, but their aim came to nothing. As they thundered off ahead of the main English host, a great hedge of the Scots spearmen emerged from the trees to stop them. knights fought hard, attempting to break the Scots by throwing axes and maces into their midst. The spearmen held firm, and the English horse got no further. The next move by Edward's army was to ford a narrow stream and make towards the Scots who watched the road. It was then that I first caught sight of Robert the Bruce, the King of Scots. I was awestruck by the sight of him, but from what I could see, Bruce's army was greatly outnumbered by Edward's huge force, and I was suddenly much afraid. Just then, a bold English knight, seeing a chance for glory, rode out alone to meet the Bruce head-on and set his lance at the King of Scots. Undaunted, the Bruce turned to meet his challenger, and all within view on both sides, stopped and held their breath. The Bruce felled this unfortunate English knight with one almighty blow. In my innocence, I thought this act of strength by Bruce, done for all to see, should have been the end of the battle but more of the English horsemen charged at the Scottish spearmen. However, the men with Bruce met the onslaught of the mighty English horsemen with stout hearts. knights returned to the main body of their army, having been driven back by the Scots. They were greatly frustrated, and late in the afternoon, Edward's army began to move north along the bank of the stream called Bannock, 
Struggling across the stream, they made a hasty camp and watered their horses. Although exhausted by the effort of the day, from what I saw, none thought of sleep. At dawn the following day, the English were already prepared and lined up for battle. Word had reached King Edward that the Scots had begun to advance upon his army in large numbers, and he sent his archers and cavalry into a position on hard ground to face his foe. Then, out of the morning gloom, the Scots appeared in the most daring fashion, and for a time it seemed like a deadly game of chess. The English archers unleashed their swarms of arrows at the Scots, but then the bowmen were stopped soon enough when Robert Bruce sent in his own horsemen to sweep them away. Still, the Scots spearmen edged nearer to the tight-packed English knights who became more unsettled the closer they got. But then the Scottish spearmen halted, knelt, and heard a mass crossing themselves before rising again to continue their progress toward the English line. So grim did the faces of the Scots look, I became certain that they did not seek mercy from any mortal man. The English could never have seen such a determined-looking Scottish army before, and although they outnumbered the Scots by some three to one, they were most eager to attack them before they got any closer. Robert the Bruce's game had become terrifyingly clear. It was to trap the English between the Pell stream to the north and the curve of the Bannock Burn and give the mighty English horse no room to charge. Then the English horsemen surged forward to attack. But with King Robert's spearmen having edged so close, the English seemed more like sheep in a pen than the invincible knights I had once thought them. The English fought hard and bravely, but were driven back by the points of the Scottish spears, which rolled on tight and terrible could see the banner of the King of Scots and Bruce himself upon his charger, urging his men forwards. The English were pushed further and further back upon themselves by those cruel Scottish pikes. Knights were unhorsed, gaps were torn in the lines, and still the unstoppable spearmen of Robert the Bruce drove on. of that crush would have been a hell. How long this bloody push and shove lasted, I cannot tell now. Only that the English mass started to crumble and break. King Edward was pulled from the field to save him from the oncoming Scots, his army realized that it was now every man for himself and began to retreat back across the Bannock Burn. I saw that the burn became a dreadful trap as fleeing Englishmen, pursued by merciless Scots, fell down its steep banks into a gory ditch of unspeakable horror. Bodies would pile so high the river could be crossed dry foot. I know only that the slaughter lasted an unbearable time. When finally it was over, I was alone amidst a field of dead and dying. The twisted, mutilated bodies of men lay as far as I could see. I could no longer tell the difference between Scots or English, but I knew that somehow Scotland had changed forever. <laughs>